Well, I'm glad to uh, have you all here at uh, Union Church this morning, and we want to welcome you to our service. We are in the middle of a series uh, called Israel's Greatest Hits as we're going through the uh, book of Psalms. And so we have about eight more weeks left in our series, but this morning we're going to be in Psalm chapter 32. So if you have a Bible, I would invite you to open to that portion of Scripture where you can follow along and take notes and, and uh, just join us as we study together. If you didn't bring one, uh, that's all right. We have it up here on the screen for you to follow along. It's also in your bulletin that you can make notes on. But before we jump into that this morning, let's just go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Lord, I do thank you for our time that we have together. And uh, I, I pray, Lord, that as we uh, go and study your scriptures this morning, that they would challenge us, that even in this difficult subject that we look at this morning, Lord, that we would be receptive to what you are trying to teach us and, and uh, receptive to what you want us to be as a result of this, uh, that we would hear the word and we wouldn't be uh, like the person who looks in the mirror and does nothing about it, but that we have been again to appropriate it in our lives. And we ask this in your name. Amen. Well, uh, people come to me all the time, you know, being a, uh, my first year in the Philippines, and they ask me the question, so uh, what do you like about the country? What don't you like about the country? And I can tell you lots of things that I enjoy about being in the Philippines. And really, I can't tell you a whole lot of things that I don't enjoy. Uh, I s certainly, I enjoy the food. I mean, I've eaten plenty since I've been here. Uh, and and it, it, it's great. Everywhere I go, there's great places to eat. I, I enjoy the weather. I, I like warm weather, so that's good for me. I, I enjoy the amenities here in Makati. I, I enjoy the people. The people are great, happy people, gentle, kind, gracious. I, I love it. And so I really struggle when people ask me, what don't you like about being in the Philippines? I, I really struggle. But this week I nailed it. <laughs> I got it. And uh, after consideration and after a period of reflection over the last eight months since I've been here, here is the answer. The cockroaches. <laughs> I just can't get used to the cockroaches. I, I, I don't know. I, I, they seem to be omnipresent. I, I sit in my backyard and they go, you know, they're just crawling around. My dogs used to attack them, but now it's like, no, we're not going to mess with these. They're everywhere. I, I go in, and, and in my house, I, I mean, they, I'll be sitting watching TV or something, and there goes a cockroach. Sometimes I think in the morning, my couch is going to be gone because the cockroaches are going to carry it away. It, it just seems like even this morning, to prove my point, I walk into the kitchen. And as I walk into the kitchen, uh, the lights are off, and I can't see what I'm doing. I turn on the lights, and when I turn on the light, I see that I have stepped on a cockroach. Its guts are hanging everywhere. I'm a cockroaches. I don't like the cockroaches. I'm not used to the cockroaches. And we do everything to try and get them out. We put out the cockroach traps. We, we buy all the stuff. And it seems like it is a constant battle with cockroaches in my house. I don't like the cockroaches. I, with that being said, this week I looked up online to see how people deal with pest infestations. And I came across a survey. And a survey of people and what people will do to get rid of pests in their house. And, and this is a survey from the state, so I'm sure it's not the same number here in the Philippines, but in the United States, 24% of adults will pay to get rid of spiders. 27 will, uh, will, will, will get pay to get rid of ants and 56 of mice and 58 of cockroaches, the worst of them all, right? And as I looked at those numbers, I thought, you know, the majority of people won't pay to get rid of pests in their house. They won't go down to the store and buy things to, to get rid of these rodents and pests and, it, you, you know, I mean, it, we start getting cockroaches and the majority of people will, but you start thinking of ants and spiders, eh, you know, it's ants and spiders, who cares? A few cockroaches in the house, that's no big deal. We, we don't mind those. And as I was looking at that and I was reflecting on that, I began to think in many ways, there are, there is a spiritual lesson for us here. And I thought to myself the question, how many Christians will live with something in their lives that doesn't belong. Kind of get used to it, get accustomed to it, and it becomes normal, and so it just becomes part of the ambiance, becomes part of the culture, part of the, part of the landscape where we live, and so we sort of just invite it in, and we just say, hey, it's just the way that it is. 
And uh, I, I even thought even further as we're talking about this thing called the coronavirus that seems to be omnipresent and, and seems to be on everybody's mind and, and all the things that we do to try and prevent contracting this coronavirus. You know, we're fist pumping. We're, we've got alcohol on, on all the doors. We're, we're washing our hands constantly. We're, we're doing everything because we don't want this bug to get inside of us. And so we, we take drastic measures, but, but do we do that when it comes to the spiritual invaders that come into our lives? And, and out of this, I, a couple of questions arose. Here's the first question that I want you to consider here. How bothered are you with things that invade your heart that don't belong? It's a good question to ask, isn't it? Does that trouble you at all? Is that, I mean, does, do you feel that sort of pathos in your heart? It says, ah, there's something here that God really doesn't want in my life. And then the second question is following the first one is, what will eventually drive you to action to get those things out? Or even prevent them from coming into your heart in the first place? See, here's the thing. I am convinced here in the modern church, in the 21st century, that what the church needs less of is more inf- less of information. Not simply more information. We're talking about we always want more information on this or that. But we need more application to what we've already got. We need application to what the scripture is teaching us. See, there's information everywhere. Uh, You know, you've got the internet, you've got bookstores, Christian bookstores, and all this information to tell us what we need to do and, and, and who God is and what he wants from us. You know, it's the information's lined up everywhere, kind of like the lines at the... uh, jeepney station on Makati and Friday night, you know, their never-ending line of people. That information's everywhere. But what is rare in our world today is right behavior, right action. And few find that line and say, you know, Lord, whatever it is, I, I want to line up in the line that says, I want to be like you. You know, it reminds me of the story of the men who were arguing about the best translation of Scripture. Uh, you know, uh, one scholar was saying, well, I, I love the King James Version. You know, the old English poetry, the Shakespearean language, it's, it's just so rich. And the other said, no, I, I prefer the American Standard. You, you know, it's more of a literal translation. And, and, and they're debating, and the third guy comes up and he says, I, I, I like the Harriet translation. The other two said, the Harriet translation? I haven't heard of the Harriet. Is that a new translation that's just come out? I said, no, my mom's name is Harriet, and she lived the word of God, and she taught it to me by how she lived. We need more people that are taking the word of God and saying, you know, there are things that it's telling us to do, and there are things it's telling us not to do, and there are things that it's telling us to eradicate from our lives, and we need to begin to integrate that into our lives. Even James in the scripture says, don't be just hearers of the word, but be doers of the word. And here we come to Psalm, the book of Psalms. And even David says in Psalm 139, he says, search me, O God, and know my heart and try me and know my thoughts and see if there is any grievous way in me and lead me to the way of everlasting. Lord, I, I want you to search under the crevices of my, uh, of my heart. I look under the sofa. Look behind the refrigerator. Look at all the areas and see if there is any invasion that, that is in my life and in my heart and in my house and, and, and search those out. And, and if you find those, Lord, get them, get them out so that I can be led to the place that you want me to be. It's an action verb. I, I want to be led, but I realize that if, I, if I'm going to be led, there are certain things that need to be, I need to leave behind in my life. Well, and that brings us to our psalm this morning. It's Psalm chapter 32, and, and we've list, looked at various types of psalms over the last few weeks. We've looked at Torah psalms and the Word of God. We've looked at wisdom psalms, psalms of lament. Last week, we looked at a nature psalm. This week, we come to one that is probably the least popular of looking at psalms. It is called the penitential psalms. It's where we get that word repentance. It's where we get that word penitentiary. You heard of that? jail. It's the place for the convicted. We, we, we say it sometimes, the penitentiary is the, the place where you send the convicted. And so when we come to this kind of psalm, not too many of us walked into church this morning saying, oh, I hope that he teaches us about being convicted. 
No, we want something other than that. We want something a little more light, a little more lofty, a little more positive. And so a lot of people, we take these psalms like the penitentiary ones and, and we sort of brush them aside because they're, they're hard for us to swallow sometimes. Nobody really likes being convicted. And along with Psalm 51, Psalm 32 comes at a time in David's life where he is convicted. It comes at a point where he commits adultery with Bathsheba. He lies, he covets, and he's involved in taking a good man's life. And he stands convicted. In fact, the prophet Nathan comes up to him in 2 Samuel 12, verse 9. And he says these words. He said, David, you can't get any more blunt than this. David, what you have done is evil in the sight of the Lord. And it sort of smacks David across the face and wakes him up as though a bad dream. The man who is a man after God's own heart is now being told, David, what you've done is evil. It's not comfortable for a man like that. It's something that really rocks his world. And he responds to that by writing these two Psalms, Psalm 32 and Psalm 51. Psalm 32, the one we'll be looking at this morning. It's this great awakening for him, and it is quite painful. You know, uh, years ago, I used to be a worship pastor in California, and I was, after I led the worship set, I was going across the parking lot to lead the children's worship set after that, and, and, and I was walking out across the parking lot. There was a man who was coming out, and he was frustrated, and, and it was right in the beginning of the preaching, and he's sort of walking at this fast pace, and I, hey, hey, guy, what, what's going on? I'd never seen him before. He's probably a visitor at the church, and I said, hey, man, can, can I help you with something? He said, I didn't come to church to hear about sin. You guys are always talking about sin. Uh, I'm like, what? We, we don't talk about sin all the time. But that particular Sunday, it was open with that word sin. And he said, I did not come here to hear that. And I got to thinking, you know, I think that's much of the mentality of our world today. That's why the penitential psalms aren't really that popular. We don't really come to a place. We didn't come to church saying, I hope he talks to me about sin. I hope he talks to me about being convicted. I hope he talks to me about my life not being right. Anybody come with that expectation this morning? Probably not. And if you did, you're a little weird. (laughs) But that's the reality, I think, in our world today. The temptation is, I don't want to hear about it. I don't want to talk about it. I want to be free to be who I am, and I don't want to look at it. Because if I do, and I do start talking about it, I might be convicted, I might be in the penitentiary, and I don't want to do that. I don't want to see myself as being somebody who is worthy of being convicted. I want to see myself through my own lens, not through the lens of God. So let's not talk about this word sin. But if we are going to be honest students of Scripture, if we want to be right, we need to talk about what's going wrong. Right? Agreed? If you want to be right, you have to talk about what's going wrong. Uh, I'm in the process right now of teaching my daughter how to paddleboard. You know, so we go to a pool, and I'm trying to get her to where she can paddleboard on the ocean. And so we start in the in the pool, and she's up, and she's doing the you know all of this. And 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 my daughter is stubborn. She gets it from her mother, not at all from me, <laughs> not at all. My my wife's not here. I can say anything I want. Don't talk to her afterwards, please. (laughs) No, but this idea is uh, she's stubborn. And and she'll get and she'll be doing things. And I'll say, babe, babe, you can get away with that in the swimming pool, but you won't be able to do that on the ocean. There are certain things you need to do. And she's like, dad, I know what I'm doing. Leave me alone already. I'm doing it. Wait, babe. (laughs) You've got to take this position. You've got to do this. And and if you don't, I'm not going to let you go out on the ocean. Unless you receive my rebuke and my correction, I will not take you out on the ocean. Because there's currents. There's waves. There are certain things that will knock you down. There are winds. There are things that will make it dangerous. So unless you do it my way here, you will not go on the ocean with me. Well, the the good news is that she starts doing that. And this last time, we took her out on the ocean, and and she realized that what her dad says is actually true. It it can be dangerous if you don't do it the right way, right? But the the reality is, she's like so many of us that don't want to receive that correction. I know what I'm doing. 
leave me alone. And, and the word of God says, no, you don't know what you're doing. And so I'm going to bring correction to you so that you will be able to thrive when the storms of life come, when the winds of life come, when the waves of life come. And, 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 and that's why I, I, I bring correction. And this is what David comes to grips with here in Psalm chapter 32. Let's look at the text. It says in verse 1 and 2, he says, Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Notice, he starts with this word, blessed. It is really good. It's a good thing when you get your paddle boarding worked out. It is a good thing. It is a healthy thing. You will be blessed. You will find the right target. You know, I, I used to play basketball, and, and my coach would every now and then say, you know, hey, you know, you got to line up your hips to the, you know, and he would correct me. And I didn't say, coach, mind your own business. <laughs> you know, I, I'm doing everything else right, and you're focusing on my one thing here? You judgmental coach. I didn't do that at all. I, I want to hit the target for my life. I wanted to be blessed in my game. And so what David is saying here, if you want to be blessed, there are certain things that you need to do. And it's dealing with this issue of sin, dealing with the pests that are invading your life. And notice what words he uses. He uses three words. It's only two in the English language, but in the Hebrew language, it's actually three words. You've got transgressions, sin, and sins. Now, these words, the word transgression in the Hebrew language really means rebellion. And, and the word, the first sin that is up here is turning away from the right path. And then the second word sin, which is a different Hebrew word, means distorted, perverted, twisted, or crooked. So let me just put all of those together. And the person who is sinning is this. They are a twisted, crooked, rebellious individual who can't see straight and is off God's path. Do you think sin's a good thing then? <laughs> Do you think we should just brush over it? If we put it all together and recognize it for what it is, the person who has not dealt with this has serious issues. And you can apply it to anything you want. If you apply rebellious, turning away from crooked to paddleboarding, you think it's going to be safe paddleboarding? You apply it to basketball, you think you're going to make the team? No. And that's what I think sometimes we miss is the seriousness of sin and that it is really bad. I, I think in our world today, we try to temper it. We try to downplay it. We try to convince ourselves that maybe it's not that big of a deal and that we can do our own thing and go our own path and, and choose our, our own journey for ourselves without understanding God's parameter or the box he wants us to live in. But, but, but sin, it, it really is bad. And it causes us to miss the mark that God has for our life. And I put it like this on, on your outline. It's very simple. Number one, and, and I'm not trying to patronize you, but I really want you to understand the reality of this. Number one, it's, it's, it's this. I need to recognize sin is really bad. <laughs> you know, if we could somehow let that commute, compute into our lives, you know, the pests that we allow in our lives, it's, it's dirty, it's bad, it's not what God wants. Even in Romans 3.23, many of you can quote it. The wages of it is what? death, if you, if you leave it untended, uh, if you leave it and, and just let it run rampant in your life and not deal with it, 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 the consequences are grave for our lives. But we think if we allow these sort of bugs in our life, ah, it's not that big a deal. It's just a cockroach. No big worries there. My, my buddy, he, um, he got married about five years ago and he went to Iceland for his honeymoon. And uh, he, he told me about a meal there. I had never heard of this meal before. I can't even pronounce it. It's called harkal. Have anybody heard that? Yeah? It's, 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 it's a nasty. He was describing it to me. It's a delicacy in Iceland. And what they do is they take a fish, a shark, and they bury it and let it ferment and rot. It sounds delicious, right? <laughs> and then they hang it up and dry it for a few weeks and cut it up and serve it and say, Harkle for everyone. Isn't this delicious? I mean, how many of us would look at this and go, mmm, I can't wait to eat some rotten fish. <laughs> you know, I, I was even thinking, we were talking to, I, whoever thought of that idea, hey, this is a great idea, you know? It was a, the village guy who was a little bit off and, and said, hey, rotten fish sounds great. And then how did it become a delicacy? You know, did, did he serve it to his children? And they grew up. To, to like it, and then pretty soon the whole culture begins to say, hey, this is good stuff. But I, I discovered every culture has their harkle, you know. You guys have balut. <laughs> I, 
I've tried it, and, you know, I was thinking, you know, who, the guy who decided to do that, could he not wait, like, 20 days for it to hatch and let the chicken grow a little bit and eat, or, no, let's just eat it now. I mean, he had to be really impatient. I don't know, but that becomes normal in this culture. And and I tried it, and I didn't like it. (laughs) But then, you know, when Europeans come to the States, I've had them stay with us before, and they, you guys eat cheese out of a can? You you know, cheese whiz. They think that's bizarre. They think it's disgusting. I love it. I can just squirt it in my mouth, and, mm, you know, that's good stuff. But, But it's strange, isn't it, that things that are disgusting become normalized in a culture. They become part of our DNA. And I think there's a message to that about some of the things that we allow that are wrong in our lives, and we go, hey, that's just part of our culture. That's just part of our world. That's just part of our DNA. And the word of God is saying, wait a second, but I have a different standard. And when I originally started, that was disgusting. But somewhere along the way, the culture began to embrace it as a delicacy. And God says, no, it's really bad. And it's even harmful. And there are things that you need to eradicate in your life. So, so, so don't get comfortable with it. And notice even what David says as a result of this, how how destructive it is to the one who consumes it. Look at what he says in verse 3 and 4. He says, you know, Lord, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Sounds fun, doesn't it? I mean, look into what he's saying here. He's saying, my bones wasted away. I was groaning. Your hand was heavy. He, meaning he was spanking me or I was being disciplined. My strength was sapped. Th- does anybody want to live that kind of life? Does anybody, I mean, it sounds like he's got the flu or something and, and he should be in bed. And, and really, this isn't supposed to be even physical. I think this is poetic, remember? I don't think that David is saying that all these things are literally happening But I do think that he is saying that this is really messing up my life emotionally. It's messing me up spiritually. It's even messing me up physically when I I don't uh, address the things in my life that God wants me to address. When we keep and allow sin in our lives and we consume it and we normalize it and we welcome it, ultimately it has detrimental effects in our life. And that's why there's agony. This is why David's crying out right here. I'm in penitentiary. (laughs) I'm in jail, I'm convicted, and it's not good. And by the way, this discomfort that comes with this, you you know, we try and run away from it. It's a good thing, beloved. You know, the conviction of God in our lives that we get to this point is a good thing. Sometimes people, oh man, what is it, psychopath? He wants me to feel guilty, he wants me to feel, no, I don't want you to stay there. But it is the discipline of God and this that brings us back to the place where God says, now I can restore you and put you on the right path of where you want me uh, to be or where I want you to be. I was reading an article about this young girl. Her name is Ashlyn Blocker. And she has this rare disease. It's called SIPA. I can't say the technical name, so I'll just say SIPA. And SIPA is this disease that you don't feel pain. None at all. Your, your body, your brain doesn't recognize pain. Now, for many of us, we go, wow, that'd be amazing, wouldn't it? <laughs> I mean, I'm getting older, and I, you know, my back and my kids jump on. Oh, don't do that. You know, my, my body is breaking down, and so they're, they're, I, I think, man, I would love to not feel pain. But for this little girl, they have to monitor. When they feed her like any kind of meal, they had to make sure that it's Nice and cool, because she'll eat it, and it'll scald her, it'll burn her. She's not allowed to play on the jungle gym, because if she falls off, and she'll break her arm. She doesn't even know it's broken. And the mom even comes out, and she says this. Some people would say that no pain is a good thing. But no, it's not. Pain's there for a reason. It lets your body know that something's wrong, and it needs to be fixed. And then she says, I'd give anything for my daughter to feel pain. Do you know, I think that's it sometimes is that the Lord sometimes makes our bones ache and our our body yearns and and we're in this place of discomfort and it's God's grace, it's this abundance of uh, of love for us that says something is wrong and you need to address it and you don't need to ignore it, but it should drive us back to him. Even Hebrews chapter 12 verse 11 says, no discipline is enjoyable when it's happening. It's painful. 
Yeah, it's painful. But afterwards, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. Right? It leads to good thing, this discipline, because it leads us back to being the person that God wants us to be. It leads us, his correction leads us back to being made right and eradicating these things in our lives. Second thing in your outline, jot it down this morning. I need to understand that pain, guilt, shame, discipline of God, that comes from sin is, is, is really good. It is. And I know that that's not a popular message in our world today, but there are times that this pain that happens in our lives where we are in this uncomfortable, convicted place, that is a good thing to drive us back to the Lord. And, 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 and you know, we as pastors, we often see people in their lowest moments. When they're going through dark things, emotionally, spiritually, physically, in their families. And I've come across people who've come into my office with incredible shame or incredible guilt of things that they've done. And, you know, we, we become, for some reason, the people that they want to confess to. All their horrible things that they've done. And they come just brokenhearted and with tears and anguish in their heart. And when they're in the middle of that, you know, I'll sit across from them. And I'll start smiling invariably. They're like, why are you smiling? Because this is really good. What do you mean this is really good? You're pouring my heart out. This is good. You're still sensitive to the Lord. You're still sensitive that you're not where you need to be and you know it and it's driving you crazy. And I say, this is really good. You, you don't even know how good this is. And we talk, and so what do, you, what do you say, Pastor? Am I supposed to sort of stay in this perpetual state of broken bones and anguish and groaning? No, not at all. Let's keep looking at what David says here. He doesn't want, the point of penitential psalms is not to have a sort of perpetual guilt trip in our lives. Not at all, okay? Let's just eliminate that thought. Because some people think that's what religion is, right? To be in this perpetual state of guilt. David, not at all. Look at what he says, he says in verse 5 and 7, he says, I acknowledge my sin to you, and I didn't cover, uh, I, and I didn't cover my iniquity any longer. I, I stopped covering it up. I stopped pretending uh, that I didn't have a problem. I, I stopped pretending that nothing was wrong with me. And I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. I, I'm going to express, Lord, I, I'm not where I need to be. And then it says, and you forgave all of my sin. Isn't that a great phrase? We'll come back to that in a minute. But then he offers advice. Look at this next word of advice that he gives. He says, therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. You are my hiding place. You protect me in times of trouble. And, and you surround me with shouts of deliverance. Notice his words. He says, therefore, what do I do? Well, I know I'm going to be forgiven, so here is my advice to all of you. When you are in the midst of that anguish, David says, therefore, go to the Lord, confess to him. And what does it say? It says, number one, he will forgive you. And then it says after that, he, 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 your waters won't drown. You will be delivered. You will be protected. All of these things. And my question, or David's question would be, if you are in this perpetual state of guilt, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you just go to the Lord? It's, it's logical, isn't it? <laughs> why, why would you try and cover that up? Why would you try and ignore that? Why, wouldn't you, why, why would you want to live in that state? Why not just go and humble yourself before the Lord and say, Lord, I need you. Have mercy on me. Why? He says all the good things that come from it. He, he's not there to thump you. Oh, you rotten human. No, he's there to say, I, I'm there to forgive you. I put last thing, or third thing on your outline this morning. I need to have frequent sin conversations with God. You, you know what I'm talking about? Anybody ever have frequent sin conversations with God? Talk about, Lord, oh, I need to confess this to you. I'm not right here. And I want to be made right. That is a place of blessing. That is a good place where it leads us to all of these things where he forgives our sin. His waters don't drown me. You deliver me. You protect me. Back to verse one. It's the blessed person who does this. 
The one who is blessed is these who have these conversations with God. Listen, early on in my life, a follower, you know, I, I, I committed my life to Christ as a, at a young age, but I decided, you know, to go into ministry fairly young age. And, and I memorized one of the first verses I memorized when I started this thing of memorizing scripture. I believe it's important to memorize scripture. And so one of the first verses I, I memorized is Psalm 51. It's the companion chapter to this chapter. It says this, have mercy. We, we said it at the beginning of the service, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away my iniquities and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my sin is always before you. Against you and you alone have I sinned. And then he says, create in me a, ple- a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in me. That's a weird verse to, to memorize, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, most people, when I was hanging out, were memorizing like, you know, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Or, you know, Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Bless you, prosper, give you a hope in the future. You're weird, pastor. Have mercy on me, oh God. N- no, I-, I realized this. Early on, it was this, Lord, I just want to be right. I don't want anything in between you and me. I I want to be the man that you want me to be. And if I'm off path, have mercy on me and restore unto me the joy of my salvation, of your salvation, Lord. I I want to be right. And if there's anything, anything at all, Lord, flood me and show, turn on the spotlight of, of your love and expose it so that I can be right before you. And you know that verse still, I, I use it a lot. Still, it's my most quoted verse in my life, believe it or not. It really is. I mean, here I am, I'm a pastor, and, and then I have a great sermon, you know, and I go upstairs, and oh, I have a good sermon today. That was a good one. I knocked that one out of the park today. Yep, yep. Let's see how many likes are on Facebook this week. And the Lord reminds me, hey, are you in this for Chad? <laughs> are, are you in this for you? And oh, Lord, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. And then I say something to somebody that wasn't really nice. You know, I don't speak the way that God will want. Lord, have mercy on me, according to your faith. I just want to be right, Lord. And, you know, and then I get mad at my kids. I blow up. Lord, have mercy on me. Whatever it is, it's one that I have to say weekly, (laughs) Because if we want to be right, we'll be in a constant conversation with God. Lord, find the things in me and and eradicate those so that I can be the person that you want me to be in my life. I need that verse in my life as much as I need any other, that I want to be right before you. I want these out of my life. I want this eradicated from my life. And so many people, I think, are talking today about, you know, positive outlook and feeling good about yourself and power of positive thinking. I I, I learned a different direction. Go down (laughs) and and humble yourself before the Lord. That's where my joy is restored and, and is removed. And I stand before him and I think, thank you, Lord, for that forgiveness. You, you know, I, I think of a pa- cancer patient doesn't need to hear that everything is okay. Right? No, it might make you feel good for a while, <laughs> but it's not going to solve the problem. We as believers don't just need to constantly hear, oh, everything's okay. Sometimes we need to hear, no, it's not okay, and that we need to make it right so that we can live the abundant life that God wants us to have and, and live in the place that God wants us to live. Now, even thinking of Luke in, in Luke chapter 11, the tax collector and the Pharisee, you, you know, remember that story? The Pharisee, power of positive thinking. <laughs> you know, I'm right, I'm good, everybody likes me, I am a man of faith. You know, it's all the stuff that we want to believe about ourselves and, and we want to hear about ourselves. And he loved that. And then comes the tax collector. And what does he do? He beats his breast and says, have mercy on me, O God. Right? Remember that? And what does Jesus say? Which one goes and is healed? And which one is justified? And which one's okay? The one who goes down. See, we're kind of getting it backwards in the modern church a little bit. Don't you think? 
positive, positive, positive. No, yeah, we, we don't start there. We start before us, Lord, have mercy. And then he says, okay, I'm going to restore you. And, and, and then, we'll, then it'll be really good. And, and that's what it comes to right, right now. Look at how David finishes the psalm. He doesn't want us to stay, remember, in the perpetual state of, Lord, I'm such an evil person. Uh, you know, I'm so awful. That's not at all what he wants from us. He wants us to get out of this groaning situation and stand right before the Lord. So look at what he says in verse 10 and 11. He says, many, of the wo- many are the woes of the wicked. Now that's logical, right? They have the unconfessed sin in their life. They have covered things up. So they've got the broken bones. They've got the heavy hand. They've got all of those things. So it says, they are what? They have many woes. So here he says, though, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts them. And then notice what he says. He says, rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. And and sing, or some translations say, shout for joy. All of you who are upright in heart. I want you to notice the three verbs here. Look at them. You have the, the, the verb rejoice, be glad, and sing. Now, we, we've just gone from broken bones, right? Now, David makes a quick turnaround. And now he's in rejoice, be glad, and sing. Why? Notice, because you are righteous, right? Now you can be glad. The Lord has forgiven you. So now you can be glad. And now you can sing. Why? Why? Because now you are upright in heart. And God has taken this. You you have been forgiven. In fact, if you go back to verse 1, he says, Blessed are the ones whose sins are forgiven. This is a good place to be in, a a place of joy and rejoicing. You're not penitentiary, not in penitentiary anymore. You're not penitent anymore. My slate is clean. That whatever I have in my life, God will faithfully forgive and he will make me righteous. Remember the the words of 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And, And that's all David needed to do. Was Lord, there's bugs in my life. There's pests in my life. Here, forgive me. And the Lord says, nah, I don't want to do that. (laughs) Nah, you slob. (laughs) No, he says, yeah, forgiveness, just like that. Yeah, you are forgiven in that moment. And he goes from bones wasting. He goes from heavy hand. He goes from strength being sapped and full of transgression and full of iniquity to being righteous and upright in heart, which evokes rejoicing and shouting for joy. Can can you see the change? It's almost instantaneous, right? Here he comes and he's, Lord, my bones are breaking. My my energy is sapped. I'm devastated, Lord. I'm not where I want you to be. I confess to you. Hallelujah! (laughs) Hallelujah! You see that radical, that's what it is. It is not to be staying here. It is ultimately, the point of penitential psalms is not to stay here. The point of the penitential song is to get you to the hallelujah and to say, you are forgiven. But it starts with this identifying it in my life and saying, Lord, I need this eradicated in my life. See, I don't understand I really, the longer I walk with the Lord, I really don't understand why it is so hard for us to acknowledge sin. When the whole point is it to get to us this place of rejoicing in our life and this place of forgiveness. He wants us to be upright. He wants us to be pure. He, he doesn't want to beat us down. He wants to make us the people that he designed us to be. And remember those people that come into my office that are sort of brokenhearted? You know, and I smile and I say, oh, you're in a good place. You know, I walk through and we pray. And then they confess and they say, Lord, forgive me. And then when I'm done, I really smile at them. Man, this is really good. You know what the Bible says? All of that, that you were so heavy hearted over. As far as the east is from the west, it's separated from you. It's gone. And then the Bible says, you know what you should do? You should shout for joy. You should sing. So not in my office, but when you get in your car, (laughs) 
You know, go let out a shout for joy and say, thank you, I am clean, I am upright, I am righteous, I am, I am perfect, I am the way that you want me to be. And then sing a little song on the way home. You see, when we get to that point where people say, oh, confess your sins before the Lord and you will be forgiven. That's not the mentality. It is confess your sins for the Lord and say, hallelujah. <laughs> And give a, a praise to the Lord and say amen. This is where, you know, you see him, you Pentecostals here, go, go, go amen, right? This is this, this good part in, in, in the word of God that we are not, the penitential psalm doesn't want us to remain in the state of brokenness. It wants to move us to this place of joy where God has forgiven us and he has, he has eliminated these things in our lives. Beloved, that's the gospel of Jesus Christ right there. In the penitential psalm, confess your sins to the Lord and shout for joy. I put number four, last thing on your outline. I need to be exuberant when acknowledging my forgiveness. I need to be exuberant. That means really excited. (laughs) You, You know, after you confess your sins to the Lord, I always like to say, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. (laughs) Thank you. Shout for joy. We don't do enough shouting for joy and for the things we need to be shouting for joy at, or what the scripture tells us to be shouting for joy for. You know, we're all consumed with this idea of the coronavirus right now. Everybody, it's on everybody's mind around here, right? We're doing everything we can to keep it out. And yet it's still, you know, it's affecting thousands every day. You know, I just heard, uh, you know, another 3,000 infected. It seems like every single day there are 3,000 in China or different parts of the world. And as a result of that, there are teams working on it 24-7. There are people trying to resolve this. There are different strategies that are blasted across the news. There are researchers that are looking at things. They are trying to stop this. You you know what nobody is doing is saying, hey, let's just ignore it. Maybe it'll go away. (laughs) How foolish would that be? How crazy would that be? Ah, we know it's not right, but that's just the way it is. That's the way we are. For you Filipinos, bahala na, right? (laughs) It's just the way it is. No, we don't do that. We, what we are doing is we are acknowledging, first of all, it's not right. And then we are attacking it and we are fervently looking for solutions to this bug before it becomes a pandemic. But this week I saw something that I don't know if it's good news. I I mean, it seems good news to me uh, in the news, right? Uh, Friday. Came out on the news, Uh, my heart leaped. Guy in England, uh, this news, UK scientist makes coronavirus vaccine breakthrough, according to Sky News. It's all in all the major newspapers, all the major websites. It says this, the scientist leading the UK research into the coronavirus vaccine says his team has made significant breakthrough by reducing a part of the normal development time from two to three years to just 14 days. He says he's testing on animals next week and he says he should have a vaccine by summer. That's good news. I mean, we go, yeah! I mean, finally, there's breakthrough, hopefully, right? We don't just sit here and go, oh, yeah, well, yeah, breakthrough, yeah, it's a big deal. Coronavirus, yeah. We don't do that. We rejoice. And I think that the lesson is here. When we hear this good news, in my mind, I'm like, yeah, you go kill those bugs. You get them. That coronavirus, I hope they die miserably. (laughs) You know, all the infectious disease. I want it out. I want it eradicated. And do we have that same disposition for the things in our lives that we need to get out, right? Lord, get it out. You've got the virus. (laughs) Get this out and be proactive. I don't just sit here and go, eh, it's just the way it is. No, Lord, I want to be right. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. Restore to me the joy of thy salvation. He forgives and we rejoice. Beloved, blessed is the one whose sins are forgiven. Lord, we come to you this morning thanking you That the word is strong, it is convicting, and yet it is for our good. And given that we might be blessed and made right before you. Thank you. And we praise you for what you've done and for your forgiveness for each one here. In your name.
Amen.